Okay, so um, we went over the fact last time that for any permutation, sorry, for any matrices A and B, when you make their tensor product, uh, it's always the case that there exists permutations uh, Q and P of appropriate dimensions such that such that you can get the commuted tensor product. And Yudong asked, when is it the case that this is equal to this? Um, and I think one example we came up with was if either of them is zero. So So we said if one of them was any scalar multiple of the other. We also said that, okay. If A is equal to any scalar multiple of B, I believe that this is the entire answer. Oh. So if it's the case that A tensor B equals B tensor A, then one of them must be a scalar multiple. Or they must be scalar multiples of each other. Um, at the very least, I was able to prove using this idea. If A tensor B equals B tensor A, then left multiply that equation by this standard basis vector, and right multiply by this standard basis vector, and that will isolate exactly a single entry of this matrix on the left hand side, and a single entry of this matrix on the right hand side. So if you, if you pass, if you multiply this through, on both sides, then you end up with A entry I K times B entry J L. So these are scalars now. This on the left hand side has to be equal to on the right hand side when you multiply this through and this through. You get B entry I K and A entry J L. So if you look at the non-zero structure of the matrices A and B, um, any time this entry is zero, that would make this zero, and so the right-hand side would have to be zero. I believe that implies that uh, B and A must have the exact same non-zero structure. So whatever the zeros of A are, then B would have to, I'm pretty sure, have the exact same non-zero pattern. And furthermore, uh, I, th this condition is even stronger than that. I'm pretty sure you can get it to imply that um, one has to be a scalar multiple of the other. Um, but that kind of a digression. So let's get back on track with the theory we were working on last time. Um, we talked about a very important property when the dimensions of the matrices work out you can pass a tensor product through or, or however you want to think of it and multiply the factors instead of the outer piece and we talked about uh, a couple uses of this we used this to look at doing faster matrix operations. Just a, a very quick review. Doing the operations on the left hand side if everything is an n by n matrix. The left hand side is an n squared by n squared matrix times an n squared by n squared matrix. And so matrix, matrix, matrix multiplication would be an n to the sixth power operation on the left hand side versus on the right hand side an n by n matrix times an n by n matrix is an n cubed operation to compute this. So same thing over here also an n cubed operation and then tensoring together or Kronecker producting together 
an n by n matrix with an n by n matrix is just n squared, um, sorry, uh, n to the fourth operations. So that was one example of using Kronecker products to speed things up. And then we gave, uh, we also looked at the example We also looked at the example of doing matrix vector products and the difference there was also somewhat drastic. So that is in the case that C tensor D or C Kronecker D is just a vector, Kronecker with a vector. Um, and I mentioned that property again because we're going to use it a few times today. And also because it, we used it last time to look at eigenvectors. Um, and then one more thing or class of things that we did using this property is we looked at some, what I'm going to call inheritance properties. What do we know about the structure of A and B? Sorry. What do we know about the structure of A tensor with B if we know something about A and about B? So inheritance properties. What properties does A tensor B inherit from A and B? Um, so the first property is that they're both invertible and in fact we know what the inverse is if both A and B have inverses. And we proved this last time using that property. Okay, well there are some other pretty neat properties that we're going to chug through. So if, uh, if A has eigenpair x lambda and B has eigenpair y mu, then A tensor B has eigenpair x tensor y uh, lambda times mu. And if there are n choices for x lambda and n choices for y mu, then there are n squared choices for these eigenpairs. And so that gives us all eigenpairs for this matrix. A neat uh, corollary from there is that we know the exact rank of A tensor B based on the ranks of A and B. So corollary, corollary from there is if A is equal to rank A and B is equal to rank B, then rank A tensor B is A times B. And the reasoning there is if there are R, if there are A eigenvalues of a that are non-zero, and there are B eigenvalues of B that are non-zero, then exactly A times B pairs will give a value lambda mu that is non-zero, which tells us the exact rank of A tensor B. So A tensor B inherits rank, eigenvalue information, invertibility. And then a handful of others that we're not going to prove but are interesting to know. So continuing the inheritance properties over here, uh, if all the eigenvalues of both A and B are positive definite or positive semi-definite, then A tensor B also will be positive definite or positive semi-definite. And you get that straight from the eigenvalue information that we just went through. Um, if A and B are both orthogonal, then so is then so is 
A tensor B. Uh, and then just some non-zero patterns. Upper triangular, upper or lower triangular. If A and B are both upper or both lower triangular, so will A tensor B. Um, if both of them are symmetric, then A tensor B also will be. If they're diagonal, or more generally, if they're banded. If A and B are both banded, both diagonal, both symmetric, then A tensor B will also be each one of those. Okay. All right, so now that we've listed a bunch of properties, we want to make use of this again to prove, our, uh, to prove the next big property that we're going to use to solve a bunch of matrix equations. So we're going to go through the vec or vector uh, vectorizing uh, operation, the, resh the reshape operation, uh, and then talk about what's called the mixed product property of the tensor product or Kronecker product. All right. So first, I'm going to define the vectorized operations. Or vectorized operation. Vector to vectorize a matrix just means to stack its columns so that you turn a matrix into a vector. It's, uh, you, you, uh, you, use MATLAB you can use MATLAB notation to do that in MATLAB of just thinking of a matrix as a vector of its columns stacked together. So if A equals column 1 up to column N, then vec of A is just the single vector that looks like this. You get from stacking its columns on top of each other. And you can also talk about reshaping a vector back into a matrix like this by partitioning it into equal parts and then stacking those parts as column vectors. With that property stated, I'm going to state and prove a theorem called the mixed product property. I'll abbreviate it MPP of the Kronecker product. So let's say we have matrices. Uh, a, X, B equal to another matrix C. And we'll just say that the dimensions of each matrix work out so that this is defined. If that's the case, um, this equation holds if and only if B tensor A times vec of X is equal to vec of C. So you can turn this matrix equation into a vector equation. And in particular, if x is unknown, then this allows you to extract your unknowns from an awkward place in the middle to a vector position on the outside, which is something that, we, that a lot of, you know, there's a lot of theory of solving matrix times an unknown vector. So we're going to use this. We're going to prove this, and then use that idea to develop some further theory. Uh, I always forget what the order of the matrices is, and where the tensor goes, and where the transpose especially goes. So I chose this lettering because I think of, I try to remember this by axbat, and then bax. And when x is on the outside, you know that's the vector version. Because when x is a vector, you want the vector on the outside. That's how I remember it. All right, so to 
prove that, I think, um, when I first saw that, I was like, that can't, no, how? That can't be true. But using the VEC operator uh, and thinking of this in terms of blocks, it, it makes more sense to me. So I want to quick, real quick, go through that. So if we look at x in terms of its columns, then that really helps. So what, what, how, what if we translate this into a column version of the statement? Okay, and then multiplying through by A, we get this. Okay, and so the first column here, C1, is equal to the first column of this, which is just the first column of this matrix times this. So, J, um, so let's say we're computing column, sorry, let's say we're computing column J. Then on the right hand, on the left hand side, what does that mean? We're multiplying this whole matrix times column J of this. And so that means we go through, uh, we go through the entire we go through every row entry from k equals 1 to, I'll just say we're going to n. And so the kj entry of this matrix times the kth column of this matrix. So we sum each, each column of this, we multiply by the kj entry of this, and we sum those together. And just from the definition of uh, of matrix matrix multiplication. That's how we compute column J of the left hand side. Okay, so now if we undo the transpose and swap this around, then this is really BJK. Okay, and now if we stack these on top of each other, all the different columns J of this on top of each other and do the same thing over here, then let me make sure I'm following the right path. Uh, we want to show this. Okay. Um, to, to turn this into this, we want to look we want to look at this in a partitioned way so b tensor a times vec of x equals vec of c this from the definition of tensor product is 1 1 i'm going to use lowercase b so it's clear it's a scalar uh, 1 n times a, 1 m times n, B, uh, m n times a, okay. And then vec x, I'm going to expand into its columns, into its different partitions. And the right hand side, same thing. Okay, so we've almost connected the two. We've almost connected this way of thinking about it to this way of thinking about it. If you multiply this vector across the block partition section J, then I claim this is exactly what we would get. Because we would have C sub J on the right hand side, which is what we want, and then on the left hand side, X sub I, or X sub K, would multiply with A, and the entry B there would be B sub J K, which is exactly what we have over here. Yeah, so we can think of this as B sub J K A, B sub, B sub J 1 A, B sub J 2 A, 
all the way to B sub J N, or rather M, no, 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 N, A. So this is a row, a block set of rows we're taking out from the block set of rows J here, and then multiplying it with the vector of all, of all the X partitions. And so that's how this summation can be thought of. And it's exactly equal to CJ on the right-hand side. So that finishes the proof that this holds. And now we're going to use that to do some neat stuff. So before I do, did I miss anything or make any mistakes or any comments or? Cool. All right. Then on we go. Oh, before I do. Uh, so we talked about one use of this equation is if these are vectors, then you can get a much faster matrix vector operation. The same is actually true of this equation, set of equations. Um, if, you, if you can think of an underlying matrix like this, then you can do this matrix vector product faster by unrolling things, or I don't think unfolding is the right word here, but by converting to this equation and performing the product. And let's, uh, that should be a quick uh, calculation to see what the actual savings would be. So if each of these is n by n, then this whole thing is n squared by n squared. And so this matvec would cost us uh, n squared work. And so on the other, on the other hand, uh, is that right? No, no, no it'd, be, it'd be n squared squared, because the length of the vector is n squared. So this would be an n fourth. There we go. Cool. Whereas if we do things this way, if each of these is an n by n matrix, then this would cost n cubed, assuming there's no additional structure, and then this one would also cost n cubed. So it's only n cubed to multiply things this way, which I think is pretty neat. So this is not as fast as using this, but this equation has the additional structure requirement that your vector is also expressed as a tensor product. Whereas this equation, we no longer have that requirement. I think that's pretty neat. Okay, using the mixed product property to solve some matrix equations. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the Sylvester equation. Uh, the second one we'll talk about is the uh, Lyapunov equation. Both of them come from um, control theory, which I know nothing about. I just know that both matrix equations come from that theory, and so solving them is useful in another branch of math. All I know about is trying to solve them. Uh, control theory and dynamical systems. All right, so the Sylvester equation is trying to solve an equation of this form. Where x is unknown and all are n by n. And the idea is to use the mixed product property to convert each of these terms to something where x is a vector on the outside. So we can think of ax as ax times the identity, and we can think of xb as identity times xb. And that's how we're gonna, that's how we're gonna use the mixed product property. Um, for that to work out, we take vec of the whole equation. We vectorize the whole equation. 
and note that note that when you vectorize stuff, vectorizing is a linear operation. So when you take the vec of a sum of matrices, that's the same as taking the vec of each component and then adding those together, adding those vectors together. Okay. Um, then we're going to sneak these extra copies of i into these expressions. So now we're going to think of this via the mixed product property. Vectorizing this is basically passing to this level. So vec of c is really just vec of this. So vec of this is equal to vec of c. Vec of c is equal to this. So vec of this is equal to I tensor A vec x. And then using the same trick here, we get B transpose tensor I vec x. And then on the right hand side from the original equation, we get vec C. Then we can factor vec x out. And the last thing we do is ask the question, when do we expect this system to be consistent? Or when do we expect this to be non-singular? So to answer this, we go back to some of the work we did on the Poisson matrix last time. We're going to use a similar trick to study the eigenvalues of this matrix and determine when there are no zero eigenvalues. So uh, Use a lemma that generalizes the eigenvalue information we computed for the Poisson matrix last time. And it's also going to tell us the eigenvalue information of this matrix. So if F has eigen information y comma lambda and G has eigen information x comma mu, then the matrix I tensor F plus G tensor I has eigen information um, x tensor Y with eigenvalue lambda plus mu. And I claim that that characterizes the entire spectrum of a matrix of this form. We're not going to prove that because of time, but it's very similar to the proof, the work that we did on the Poisson matrix last time. Um, and the punchline, the use here is that if lambda plus mu is never zero for any combination of eigenvalue lambda of f and eigenvalue mu of g, if that's never zero, then this matrix is uh, non-singular. So the Sylvester equation has 
a solution, or at least uh, Sylvester is non-singular when this is non-zero for A and B transpose. So Sylvester is non-singular when the eigenvalues of A plus the eigenvalues of B transpose never, never give you zero. Uh, and when would that happen? B would have to have an eigenvalue, sorry, B transpose would have to have an eigenvalue that is the negative version of an eigenvalue of A. All right. So that is how, so as long as that condition holds, then the solution to, then Sylvester has a solution because the system would be, this system would be non-singular. Now, in terms of efficiently solving that, I don't know about this being the best way to do that, but it would work. I, don't, I just don't know that it's efficient. Okay. Cool. Okay. Any, any questions on that as I speed along? Cool. So the next equation, Lyapunov equation also comes from uh, control theory dynamical systems. And there are a couple variations of this equation, a continuous and a discrete among others. I don't understand the, the differences and the details, but uh, one way that this comes up is like this. Where all the matrices are n by n, uh, x is unknown, uh, and q is Symmetric, or or maybe potentially complex matrices. So this would be the um, conjugate transpose, and Q would be Hermitian. So it's my claim that a very similar approach leads us to a solution of this. Uh, you end up getting a slightly different linear system, though. So, so I'll leave out those details because I think they're good to go through on your own. Similar approach yields the system uh, I minus, I believe it is I minus A tensor A vec X equals vec q. And the, <clears throat> so then the condition for a solution existing is that this is non-singular. And that happens as long as a does not have one or negative one as an eigenvalue. So, so, if spectrum of A uh, if spectrum of A does not have does not have one or negative one, this is consistent, non-singular even.
And the, and the proof of this is to use the mixed product property the way we did on the Sylvester equation, or in a similar manner to the Sylvester equation. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about, which I think is pretty awesome, um, is an analog of a nice theorem coming from the SVD. So the Eckert-Young theorem, so I should say a Kronecker product analog of the Eckert-Young theorem for the SVD. So just a brief review of the Eckert-Young theorem. Uh, let's say you want the best approximation to your matrix A that has, as, uh, that has rank no greater than some fixed constant K. Um, so, so minimize this. Uh, such that rank of x is bounded by some constant, I'll also I'll call it c, where this box means the 2 norm or the Frobenius norm or any norm that is orthogonally invariant. Then, I've run out of room, then the Eckert-Young theorem says that the best such approximation is just the first C pieces of the singular value decomposition. And R is the rank of our matrix A. So the best low rank approximation of your matrix A, at least the best approximation in a two norm sense or a Frobenius norm sense, the best you can do is take the first C vectors from your singular value decomposition. And the next thing we're gonna do is a Kronecker product analog to that. Or well, we're gonna do a very special case of it. So um, you can think of I don't know much about these, they sound pretty neat, but you can decompose a matrix A as a sum of, I'll use a different constant, we'll call them S. Uh, so I don't know what letter to put here, I'll call it T. So you can decompose a matrix A as a sum of Kronecker products. The lowest such number that you can do, I believe is called the tensor rank of A or something. I'm, I'm unclear on some of the details of this. Um, so if you want to express, if you want to approx if you want to find the best approximation for A by using no more than T such t uh, chronicers, chroniker products, then there exists uh, an analog to the Eckert-Young theorem, there's something about a Kronecker SVD expression for A, and you just take the first T terms from that Kronecker decomposition. Um, that gets a little more complicated than would take too much time, so we're going to do just a special case and look at the nearest low rank, uh, I'll call it the nearest Kronecker product, or solving the because it's not a low rank property. This could even be a full rank matrix, but it's 
low rank in the sense of fewest number of terms in this sum. Okay, so nearest Kronecker product is what we're going to call this. Uh, so we want to solve A minus BC. And by solve, really what I mean is minimize with respect to B and C. Find matrices B and C that make this as small as possible. Now one thing to point out, there's nothing, that the, there's nothing inherent to the Kronecker product about the dimensions of the things you plug in. So just by writing this, I haven't really specified anything. You could pick this to be a vector and this to be a vector and just have this would be a low rank decomposition in that case. And you could pick B and C to be the largest singular vectors. And that would minimize this in a sense. Um, so let's say to, to fix the dimensions so that we can't do that anymore. Let's say A is M by N, where M is that product and n is this product then find b of these dimensions and let's assume that neither of these numbers is 1 so that we're no longer looking for vectors So now we can't think of this as a subcase of the Eckert Young theorem or a low rank decomposition. Now it's Kronecker decomposition. Now it's a find, find the Kronecker product of these specified dimensions that is closest to A. And the neat, I think this is kind of neat. What we're going to do is basically partition the equation and then rearrange the blocks so that we can think of this as a matrix minus a outer product of vectors and basically reduce this to an SVD computation and, and use the Eckert-Young theorem is essentially what we end up doing. So since there are seven minutes left, I will state the result and then we will prove it. So, okay. Um, the solution uh, comes from the following. It comes from solving this low rank approximation using the SVD. So I'm going to call this A tilde reshape, I think. Yeah, so I'm calling this A tilde minus vec B vec C transpose. And so we'll get to what this is. So it's, it's a rearrangement of A. And we'll get to how you do that. Um, so we're going to rearrange A, and we'll show how in just a second. Then look at, since this is a rank 1 approximation, this is a vector, this is a vector, you just take the largest singular vector value triplet for this new matrix A that we form. And then each of those vectors, you unvec them, and that will give you a matrix B and a matrix C. And then those matrices B and C, those are the solution to this problem. So the proof is constructive, well, the proof constructs A tilde such that it is clear that if you do use Eckerd-Young and find the SVD triplet that best approximate this, then when you unvec these vectors, then you'll get the uh, corresponding B and C. OK, 
Okay, so the goal is to minimize this. So I'm going to expand this and why not square it? If it minimizes this, it also minimizes that, so we can square it. Um, we're going to expand this and look at this blockwise. So this is going to blow up to, I'm going to partition A so that this uh, makes sense. So this is a block partitioning of A so that the partitions of A line up with the entries of B tensor C. So by definition, this is what the Kronecker product means. Okay. Now, we're not going to use VEC on A, not quite. We're going to use like block VEC on A. So this is a, this is a block matrix. We're not going to vectorize the block. We're going to stack this column of blocks. We're going to stack A like that. So this becomes A11, A21. A M11. So that's the first column of blocks. And then you put the next column of blocks under it. And then continue on the uh, continue on all the way down to the last entry. Okay. And then do the exact same re-blocking or rearrangement of the blocks over here. So that we get B11. B21, B, M, N, uh, yeah, C. And note, I can write that those values are equal to each other. This value is equal to this value. Because when we take the Frobenius norm, we're squaring every single entry and adding all that together. So even though we've rearranged the shapes of the matrices, the Frobenius norm value is the exact same. Sure. OK. Uh, almost done. The, the next step is that now we vectorize each one of these blocks and stack those. And do the same thing on the right hand side. And now finally, um, I claim we can view this as VEC B tensor VEC C. And I claim we can think of this as vec of A tilde. A tilde is a rearrangement of A. OK, now reshape this equation so that this is a square and so that we can think of this as vec of B times vec of C transpose. So that now, this is exactly the low rank decomposition format that we want. This is a vector times another vector transpose. It's a rank one approximation of what is now a square matrix when we reshape this. So I don't know exactly what the reshape is or what a tilde is, but we can just say it's just a permutation of the entries of the original matrix A. And we can figure it out. 
So now the, yeah, the best that we can do is find the singular value decomposition of this, or at least the, the leading singular vectors, and that's where we get B and C. Okay, out of time. Um, wish we had a little bit more time, but oh well. Cool. So any questions as I dismantle the camera? Sure. Um, so I know with the Eckert-Young, I'm trying to see how the analogy, um, so like one thing people really like about it, it's not only true like in an infinite precision sense, it's true subject perturbations. Right. Which means instead we can do like a, in lieu of an SVD, which is expensive for a lot of matrices, something like a randomize R if you are. And okay. And use the same results. Do you know for huh. your Eckert-Youngish thing there? Since we're doing, ooh, yeah, well, yeah. Any, any, any change to A that you make, That's what I'm asking. you would have to make a ch the change to B, uh, okay. B chronic or so C. So yeah, I don't know how, how well that carries over.